Hello, everyone, and welcome to worship from Ansley United Church. It's Sunday, May the 17th, and it's pretty obvious that we're not in Ansley today. In fact, you're in my home. This was the Harkaway United Church up until June of 1979. So for 41 years, there has never been a service here, and we thought, let's change that today. This beautiful building was built in 1893, and it continued as a very successful church up until 1979, at which point all of the remaining members joined Ansley United Church. So this church really has become part of Ansley's history. It's wonderful to be able to do the church service here today. Um, we have a few things that are original to the church. We have the original pulpit chairs. We have the original communion table. And when I moved in here, of course, members were bringing me all kinds of things, memorabilia to remember the place. So welcome. I'm glad you can be here today. Um, I, the prelude I'm going to play today actually comes from the Methodist Sunday School Hymnal. And this is a book that was given to me by one of the former members. So I do hope you'll enjoy the service. If you do, don't be afraid to hit that thumbs up button. And even better, hit the subscribe button. Let us know that you're really enjoying what we're doing. I'm going to invite Reverend John Smith to come up now, and I'll go over to the piano. Awesome. Thanks a lot, David. And it is a pleasure to be here in your home. And uh, thanks for your welcome of our time here. Um, just a couple of announcements. Our ad office administrator, Patty, is putting together our newsletter for May. And uh, that should be coming out next week. So we just wanted you to, to look for that. And included in that will be a financial snapshot. And we know that a lot of people have been asking, you know, how are we doing financially? And uh, so hopefully we'll get a little bit of a, a picture of that in this coming week. Um, just one other thing, as we're thinking about uh, summer coming up and the possibility of continuing uh, our video services through the summer, one thing that I would really like you to do is uh, if there is a particular story or a passage of scripture, something that has always puzzled you or something you would like us to focus on, just let us know. Um, I've included my email in the uh, paper copy of this service and I would really like to get some feedback from you on that. So we hope that you have a lovely long weekend. Uh, my new little garden plants are all celebrating the drink of rain that they've been getting. And so I was thinking that I could myself try to be as open and receptive as my little plants are to the rain that's coming. So uh, without further ado, David, over to you.
just as we light the Christ candle, let us remember that we have the Christ light in us and that our duty is to bring the Christ light to the world and into our lives. So we gather in Christ, with Christ, and before the light of Christ. Now, we're going to start with our opening song, which we've been teaching you the last couple of weeks. So now there's no excuse for those of, at, uh, those of you at home. Uh, you're going to be able to sing along with this. It's just one line uh, where two or three are gathered in my name. I am there. I am there. And Connie and Leora are going to help us uh, through that. We're going to sing it as a round again. So uh, please join us. <laughs> We're going to sing two hymns now, back to back. And the first one is called River. Um, the words to it are printed on the uh, print printout copy of the service that uh, was emailed to you. And uh, we'd really like you to sing along with us. It's super easy, even though I'm sure you don't know it. And then we're going to sing uh, Shall We Gather at the River. So there's kind of a river, uh, a river of light theme running through our service today.
Thank you very much. So as we gather today at the beautiful river, in our minds at least, <clears throat> let's take a moment to quiet our minds and still our thoughts and uh, bring our hearts to a place of peace and quiet. I'm going to ring my bowl and then uh, we'll have our prayer. I'm going to ring the bowl again and then we'll say the Lord's Prayer together uh, at the end. So let us pray. Spirit of life, you have brought us to life at such a strange period in the life of the world. With everything swirling around us, doubt, fear, uncertainty, but also compassion, care, and love, we can sometimes become overwhelmed. We can sometimes be overwhelmed by life's journey the shoals, the shallows, the strong currents, the rolling waves, the times of aimless drifting without direction, the waterfalls which shake us up and sometimes bring us grief. Be present with us now, O Holy Spirit, as we contemplate the journey thus far, hold us and heal us, revive us, enliven us, quench us, rebirth us for the living of these days. And when we feel directionless, purposeless, or hopeless, Russia down your river of hopes and dreams to carry us along to better days. Help us kneel on the shore of the river of life and help us remember we are each made of living water. Our souls, our spirits, our bodies, our minds, are expressions of your living spirit, which all flow from the heart of your divine oneness. May we today, in our worship and in our living, be filled with your living spirit, O God. And may the living water you have planted in us become transformed into the wine of hope and beauty and new life. And now won't you join me in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And now I've asked David Fries to play us a piece of music. David. Well, you've probably noticed this bottle of wine sitting here. Uh, it's not a, a kind of wine that I've ever tried before. I was just at actually at the independent store in Port Elgin. And uh, by the way, you can buy wine now at the grocery store. Who knew? And uh, I saw it there and I like the name of it. It's called Foreign Affairs. And uh, so I thought if it's Foreign Affairs, it must be something heavy duty. So we'll see. We'll try it a little bit later. Anyway, uh, just thinking about uh, the story of turning water into wine in uh, the Gospel of John. And just to say that when we get to the Gospel of John, we're reading very late material. We're reading uh, material that has been edited a few times. And uh, the, the, the meat of the Gospel is in chapters 2 to 11. And the story of the water to wine is the first of the stories that are told in that particular section. It goes like this. Three days later, there was a wedding in the village of Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. Jesus and his disciples were guests also. When they started running low on wine at the wedding banquet, 
Jesus' mother told him, they're just about out of wine. Jesus said, is that any of our business, mother, yours or mine? This isn't my time. Don't push me. She went ahead and told the servants, whatever he tells you, you do it. There were six stoneware water pots there used by the Jews for their ritual washings. Each uh, pot held 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus ordered the servants, fill the pots with water, and they filled them to the brim. Now fill your pitchers and take them to the host, he said. And they did. And when the host tasted the water that had become wine, he didn't know what had just happened, but the servants knew, of course. He called out to the bridegroom, Everybody I know begins with their finest wines, and after the guests have had their fill, brings in the cheap stuff. But you have saved the best till now. This act in Cana of Galilee was the first sign Jesus gave, the first glimpse of his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum along with his mother, brothers, and disciples, where he stayed for several days. Well, I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, the subject of alcohol was strictly taboo. Alcohol was not allowed in our home. It was never served to guests. You would never come to my house with a bottle of wine for the host. Beer was deemed beneath us, wine and spirits, the work of the devil. Can you guess why? I was raised by two parents who grew up themselves, one a Baptist, one a Methodist, in the days of the Depression and the Temperance Movement. For my dad, the concept of never touching a drop of alcohol in his whole life was a badge of honor that he wore until the day he died. My mom, too, just as adamant. I have been at weddings with the two of them when it comes to the time to toast the bride and groom, and they'll lift up that glass as if they're going to participate and then set it down on the table, never, never taking a drop. Those preachers of old old during the temperance movement did their finest work in scaring the bejesus out of a whole generation of people should they ever touch alcohol. Instead, they had uh, the Protestant work ethic as a stand-in and a replacement. You know the Protestant work ethic. Work hard because your salvation depends on it. Never put off to tomorrow what you can do today. And don't even think about stopping for a moment of joy along the way. Your rewards will all be in heaven, not here on earth. Wow, I bet a lot of you can resonate with some of that. Back in the day, I remember the very first sip of wine I ever had. It was absolutely horrible. It was a... Wine, I think, made by Andre's Wines from Niagara called Baby Duck. I remember thinking how cool it was that I was old enough to try Baby Duck. But I also remember thinking, I can't believe how bad this is. Later, when I became a minister in a Protestant church, of all things, especially in the 80s, I still hadn't developed much of a taste for wine or beer. But the fact was, if my car was seen in the LCBO parking lot, tongues would wag, phones would ring. I know ministers who still to this day shop for wine and other things, I guess, in distant towns. So... I'm thinking there's maybe something not quite healthy about that. The Bible, if we want to talk about wine, is a primary textbook for discussing this uh, uh, elixir. The Bible was composed in a culture where having a successful vineyard was seen as a sign of God's faithfulness to you. God rewarded those who could turn grapes into wine, and across the known world, before Jesus and after, 
Grapes were grown because they could survive in any kind of soil. So you know all those hillsides that you see in pictures of Galilee and Palestine. Hillsides are for goats and grapes. Stony soil is for goats and grapes. When the Babylonians came along in the year 586 BC and took the Israelites off to exile in Babylon, they tried to kill the spirit of the people by burning down their vineyards. Wine, then as now, was seen as a gift of the gods, more so a particular sign that a community that could live in one place long enough to plant vines and have them produce wine was a sign of God's faithfulness. If you think about it, it's that kind of sign that we're kind of still looking for during this pandemic. We're looking for a sign that will help us have hope for a future as yet um, unimagined. In the new world, most of the wineries uh, that were started were in California, started by monks who had moved there from Mexico. And, uh, but on the eastern side of North America, which is kind of germane to, to us, uh, growing grapes was a challenge. And so the importation of rum from the Caribbean was uh, the way people got a lot of their drink. So prohibition... Uh, and the time of temperance all started because of the evils of Caribbean rum. And it was in the beginning anyway, less about having wine, either with dinner or for communion, than it was at keeping the evil uh, rum runners out of North America. But when it came to the church and church uh, ministers in particular, talking about the evils of alcohol to their uh, constituents, they just used a broad brush and claimed that anything made out of alcohol was uh, therefore evil. And as you know, uh, it did have an impact. In John's gospel, though, we have to understand a little bit about the wine culture in uh, the Old and the New Testament to understand what it is and how important this sign of turning water into wine was. Because this story is the very first one that John chose to tell about Jesus. And as it even says, the revelation of who he was, was... Uh, the, the first story kind of like um, setting a diamond on a pillow and presenting it to you, the reader, and saying, this is the most important thing that you need to know about this Jesus person. And so this transformation of water into wine has some kind of deeper meaning. And in other places in the New Testament, uh, we hear about living water. We hear Jesus say, I am the water of life. I am eternal living water. And then uh, we start to think about ourselves being made of water and what that possibly means uh, in the context of being transformed. The Book of Signs forms the architecture of John's Gospel. For the most part, these stories, which are aligned like pearls on a string, include the one today, the wedding at Cana, the woman at the well, the encounter with Nicodemus, all of which, curiously enough, in this Gospel, introduce characters to us that are not found in the other Gospels. These are set pieces, kind of mythical in tone and form. And it makes these stories feel as if they are pointing to something not quite on the page. What could it be? Well, that's your job as the reader. That's my job as the interpreter to try and figure out what these stories are actually pointing to. If you step back from them, uh, and this is always a good practice when you're looking at Bible stories, uh, to step back from them and look at them from a distance, we can see that all of these stories are talking about a great awakening or the opening of eyes who couldn't see. A major shift in understanding. The woman at the well, 
finds out about living water and it changes her life. Nicodemus is challenged to think about being born again, but this time in a spiritual sense. The blind man is given sight even though he was blind from birth. And that man who was paralyzed for 38 years is told all he has to do is get up off his mat and walk. And he does. So all of these stories are about a transformation of an individual. Each person whom Jesus encounters undergoes this kind of fantastic shift, um, a dawning of a new awareness. In today's language, we would say a conscious awareness. And so the wedding at Cana is the beginning of this story of transformation. It's not about Jesus being transformed. This is, these are not stories about about the transformation or the spiritual journey of Jesus. These are stories about the spiritual transformation of people who encountered him. The disciples of Jesus get a first look at him, uh, this man who would be their teacher and who would fill their minds, uh, empty jars perhaps, with new thoughts that will transform the world. Living water in the mind's of disciples. Those six water jars had been used uh, for ritual hand and foot washing, very similar to what we encounter today when we go to the grocery store. There's a hand sanitizing station on the way in, and that's exactly what those uh, ritual jars were for. But here they function as a sign of the old religion, which has become empty, like an empty jar. It is time, the gospel writer is saying, for new life to emerge, and this embodied in the presence of Jesus. The wine points to how it is when we begin to open our eyes to the way of Christ and how following his way will completely transform his life. Now, the theme of water and rivers and uh, the river of life and the river of light flows all through the Bible, right from the beginning, right, in fact, right to the very last chapter in Revelation chapter 22. And so very famous uh, Italian guy by the name of Dante Alighieri wrote this a divine comedy in which he described conversations and spiritual journeys through the different aspects of, well, hell, purgatory, and heaven. And so in the last uh, of the three, the last of the trilogy, Dante said, as he was writing it, that he felt like he was drinking from the river of the water of life. This described in the last chapter of Revelation. And I think it's really important to remember this because in in, uh, chapter 22, Revelation, we hear, then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God. I'm noticing the direction here, flowing from the throne of God and of the lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. The writer, you see, is describing a scene which is heaven on earth. He says there's a tree of life beside that river bearing 12 different crops of fruit which will bring healing to the earth. There will be no more night for God alone will be their light. It's, it's, it's a vision of heaven on earth. And so we get a sense by the time we get to the very end of the Bible of what the end goal is. What is the end goal of all of this spiritual transformation that Jesus was teaching his disciples about? It is to find heaven on earth. Not in some afterlife. Not at the end when everything's all over and they put our body in the ground. But now, even today. Coming back to wine. So what wine is in the Bible, it is a symbol, a foretaste of the paradisical vision. The paradisical vision, I know that's kind of a funny term, draws us toward the time when peace and harmony will reign on the earth. In other words, heaven on earth. 
Anyone who reads wine reviews, as I sometimes do, will scoff at the lofty descriptions used to articulate the flavor of the wine. This wine tastes like black cherries dipped in chocolate, we might read. This wine tastes like sweet honey on green grass. Why anyone would want to drink that, I have no idea. This wine has hints of coffee and tobacco. It's easy to make fun of them until we realize what these reviewers are doing. They are trying to express in words the beauty of heaven on earth. Because wine in their mouths is like heaven on earth. And so this is why in the old days, they used to have wine with communion because you would eat the bread of the here and now and then you would transform it with the wine which lifted you to visions divine. And it was a much more embodied religion than what we're used to. Uh, for, for us, religion is all about the mind, all about the thoughts, all about belief. But the beauty of the kingdom of heaven, you see, what the Bible tells us is it's in the mouth and it's in the body. It goes into the body. It's sensuous. It makes you warm, which is maybe why those temperance preachers took such a hard line because they didn't want anything to do with anything that was sensuous in any way. They wouldn't want anybody to have any joy because joy wasn't to be found on earth. Joy was to be found at the end of your life. My friends, I believe this kind of thinking is impoverished and leaves us wanting. So you see, I think when I read the story at, of the wedding at Cana, I see the empty jars as being a joyless existence. During times of crisis like this COVID time, this is an empty jar kind of time. The jars are empty. We're tired of this long expanse of confinement. We ask ourselves, you know, trying to cope with our anxiety, we ask ourselves, how long will this continue? How long will this have to go on? And of course, nobody can give us a good answer or an easy answer. Mary says, there is no more wine. And so this is the voice of the starving. This is the voice of the hollowed out, the emptied out, the bottomed out folks of the world. There is no more wine. There is no more joy. There is no more life inside my body. The longer our isolation and fear continues, the more we feel like we are shrinking away, shriveling like grapes on a vine. But the gospel story of the wedding at Cana just won't leave it there. There is a river of light flowing from the heavens, bringing paradise to us and us to paradise. And we, who may be too empty and tired to search for it, for it, or who may have become so jaded and defensive against it, or so proud and so entitled that we don't need to depend on anything so ephemeral, ephem ephemeral, we find it hard to believe that all we need to do is kneel on our knees in adoration of that which gives us life and put our hands to cup this river of life to our mouths, a river flowing underneath our feet, a river, river of crystal light and shining peace, bringing, when we drink it in, bringing hope and healing and, and life. Joseph Campbell stated many times that all of our seeking and all of our striving to make meaning for our lives 
our hero stories, that each of us is kind of living out our own hero story. I guess the goal uh, is to become the hero of our own life. He would see in Jesus, the hero's journey, a set of steps through life that lead to higher and higher states of conscious awareness. The signs in John's gospel being the visible expression of those steps. But let's remember the journey in John's gospel is not about Jesus. There's no transformation happening when we worship the journey of someone else. When we read the gospel, the transformation is about us. We're the ones empty. We're the ones that have the water poured into us. And then through our living, transform the water into wine. We set out to explore all the mysteries, to seek new understanding, to have our faith challenged, to raise our consciousness, to have our eyes opened, to find new ways of being human. And we must do that for ourselves. No one else will do it for us. And of course, we're going to make mistakes. We're going to get lost. We'll take detours that take us years to get out of. And then one day, we'll get to the holy center of it all and realize that we're on the threshold of a mystery. Like that first time you go to Grand Canyon and stand on the edge of the cliff and look over and see what you've never seen before this grandeur, this mystery, this unfathomable joy comes over you. And in that moment, you stop searching and you realize, I am fully alive. I am fully human. Remember what I said last week about those I am statements of Jesus? We have to come to that place ourselves where we say, I am fully alive to the best of my ability with all my warts and all the things that have happened to me in my life. I am, just as Jesus says over and over in the book of signs, I am the living embodiment of the hope, the hope that we are going to be okay after all, that we are going to make it, and that... I am full of that which will make my heart sing. And then we'll never live the same way again. Paul said, we have Christ within us, the hope of glory to come. And so when we come to that point of transformation in our own lives, we're free to live the best life we can live right here and now in the present because this day, today, is the day heaven is on earth. I can think of only one more thing to say. You sitting there with heaven dripping down your chin and stains on your knees. Cheers. Amen. Well, we're going to finish our service with a hymn that none of us have ever sung before. And uh, it's in our hymn book. And we're going to sing it to the tune of Take My Life and Let It Be.
So friends, as we end our service today, may you be blessed by the light and the love of Christ. And may the love and the light of Christ be in you such that you are transformed this day and every day. And as you walk through your day and through this week, may each day be a piece of heaven on earth. Amen. Thank you.